How's everybody? Good. Good. <laughs> Heather's good anyway, huh? Amen. Oh, it's a great day. We're here. We're ready to praise. We're focusing our minds on God. He's a great God. I just want to uh, let you know some announcements. Uh, tomorrow, 6.30, is the Awana. Uh, and uh, Tuesday, we have an elders meeting at 6. No Awana tomorrow. No Awana Awana? Okay. Just, okay. Here, here's the latest update. Breaking news. Awana is canceled tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll fill you in once we find more facts. So uh, Tuesday's uh, elder meeting at 6. Uh, we have the prayer power hour on Wednesday uh, at 10 a.m. in the library. Or library, depending on your... 8 o'clock? It's 8 o'clock. It says 10 in the, the bulletin. 8. Then why does it say 10? Oh, okay. The Holy Spirit didn't, doesn't get confused. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Well... Good thing I'm doing these announcements, huh? Uh, we, we got everything cleared up. <clears throat> Eight to nine, per power hour. Women's Bible study at 10 on uh, Saturday. Uh, but before Saturday, there's Friday. And um, I just want to reemphasize October 20th. That's a Friday, isn't it? Yes. yes. Uh, we do have this time changer movie, and you will be fined if you do not attend. No, you won't be fined. Um, but we want to keep that in our prayers. We want to keep that in our hearts. It's a very important thing for us to become a part of. It uh, helps us to, to talk with people about the Lord. It's one of our jobs. Okay? So... Uh, that's uh, about all I got right now. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we give you praise for this day. We give you praise for our worship. The ability for us to come out in a, a free country still and be able to worship you freely. Maybe not as you deserve, but as best we can do. Lord, we pray that your spirit will come upon us. Fill each heart and mind. Direct this service as you will. We will praise you everlasting. In the name of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you want to stand, we'll, we'll get started with our service this morning. that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But He came and He died and He rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But He came, and He died, and He rose Those giants are dead now This is our God, this is who He is He loves us This is our God, this is what He does He saves us 
He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. They so weak that we could barely pray, but he cared every word. Every whisper. Now there's altars in the wilderness. Tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. This is our God. This is who he is. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, that heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus who pulled me out of that pit. He did, he did, who paid for all of our sin. Nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Him. This is our God, this is who He is, He loves us, sing it out. This is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. is around me because nothing stands between me and my God and the fear that was my prison is no longer where I'm living because nothing stands between me and my God there's no place I go that he is not the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. We'll be dancing through the darkness because we believe it. We'll be strong with us today at the name of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. When the ground below is shaken, my joy can be taken if nothing stands between me and my God so I'm looking to Jesus the open that storm to pieces if nothing stands between me and my God no the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom we'll be dancing through the darkness 
because we believe it. Every stronghold has to break at the name of Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Watch the lies break on. Watch the enemy flee. Watch the walls come crumbling down when the people of God sing. Hear the heavenly roar, their very heart set free. Hear the chains of shame hit the ground when the people of God sing. Watch the lies break on. Watch the enemy flee. Watch the walls come crumbling down when the people of God sing. Hear the heavenly roar, every heart set free. Hear the chains of shame at the ground when the people of God sing. Sing it out. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We'll be dancing through the darkness, because we believe it. Every song that has to break at the name of Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We'll be dancing through the darkness, because we believe it. Every song that has to break at the name of Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, there is freedom. There is freedom. There is freedom. Please be seated. A deaconess, a brief deaconess meeting today after our service here. I uh, wanted to also uh, pick up off of where Chris left off on the 20th. There is a bulletin insert in all of your bulletins of the movie coming up on the 20th. I want to encourage you to be praying about that and uh, to put it inside the hands of someone that uh, God might bring to mind. Uh, this is a movie that um, uh, we've been praying for revival all year long, right? That's our theme. It might even be our team theme for next year, but it's a movie that uh, we need to see. It came at a right timing. God knows. And, um, and again, I mentioned that I, I want at least 20 people here. Um, and if anyone comes and watches this movie and can honestly tell me that that movie has no relevance to our times today, I will give you $5, and I promise that. All right? It's not much money, but you can go to 5 and below and get yourself something. Right, uh, but uh, the 20th, I want you to let's be praying about that. Uh, that movie, uh, also wanted to uh, just let you know that the, the song that you picked this morning that we just finished singing uh, was God led. Trust me, that was God led. I want to ask Brother Mike if you can come up and share a few thoughts with us, and uh, let's begin our service. It's on, but they, I don't know if they're working on it. They're working on it? Well, good to give me a minute to bring up what I need to bring. Can you hear me? Cool. Hey, there we go. Oh, Marlon said he hears you. Oh, right. <laughs> That was a cool song, by the way. That really leads into, I noticed that too. 
Actually, Pastor Jay uh, asked me to uh, come up and share a few thoughts <clears throat> uh, that came from the Bible study this week. Uh, we have a Tuesday Bible study twice a month, and honestly, we have some pretty deep discussions sometimes. Uh, what I like about it personally is, you know, I like when I hear messages like Sunday morning, I think about them and how they might apply to my life but I don't really have the opportunity to talk to anyone about it. But at a Bible, sp a Bible study small group, that's where you can come out and you can you know, ask about what does, what does that verse in the Bible mean? Or, or like we discussed this week, uh, here are some of my struggles that I'm going through. Here's what my Christian life is like, you know, and we get to pray for one another and with each other. So it's a wonderful uh, thing that we enjoy and uh, we had a good time this week and uh, what it was about, <clears throat> we're studying uh, the Holy Spirit. We were in the gifts of the Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. However, do we, do we always experience that freedom? And, you know, what are some of the things that might cause us not to uh, be able to do that? And um, so we were talking, Pastor Jay uh, said, okay, if the church is operating in all these spiritual gifts, why aren't we, you know, why aren't we living a victorious life? And he said, well, turn to Galatians. <laughs> and so we looked at Galatians and we looked at one of the stumbling blocks and uh, you know, theologians uh, talk about there's like three enemies we have as Christians. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil. All right, the world is the world system, all the things in the world, government, uh, philosophy, entertainment. And the flesh we were talking about, and in Galatians it talks about some of the th these things. <clears throat> Galatians 5 talks about uh, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgy, orgies, and things like these. And, you know, I was saying how it hit me. I said, you know... One of the things that I like to do is I like to use social media apps. <laughs> and I go on the internet, and I notice it brings out the very worst in people. It sounds almost like this, you know? Enmity, strife, people arguing back and forth. And that's how it impacts me, social media. And, and, it got to, and I got to thinking, uh, and I shared that. That's one of my struggles. But here I am using a tool of the world to try to make sense of the world. How foolish is that? Okay, and then I, I, and then I said, you know, one of the other things is sometimes I have doubt. I doubt certain things, you know, in my Christian life. Is the Bible really what it, what it says, you know? And I know college kids, when they go, they feed those, they plant those doubts in your, in your mind. Is it true? Well, I know Jesus is true. He is the truth, the way, and the life. And that's the only thing I'm asked to put my faith in. I don't have to worry about all those other things, all right? So Jesus is true, all right? And that's where we got into faith. And I said, you know, sometimes I have these thoughts that come into my head. Where do they come from? And I hear... I've heard other pastors say that. Well, even when they're up preaching, they get these thoughts coming into their heads. Well, where is this coming from? Well, we have the world. Here we have the flesh. Then we have the third thing. And Pastor Jay said, well, let's turn to Ephesians 6, and let's see how we deal with that. And we talked about the armor of God and how we should put on the armor of God. And you know those six items one being the shield of faith, where we can extinguish those fiery darts from where? From the enemy, from the devil. Put on the helmet of salvation. Keep your mind 
You know, we have faith. The girdle of truth. What is true? You know, Pilate said, what is true? He didn't realize. He was looking in the face of truth. Jesus is truth. Right? Okay, so... How do we go about living this Christian life? We have to face reality. We have, we're in a war. The Christian life, you know, it's not all, uh, you know, whatever, roses or whatever. When you, you're entering a battle, you have enemies out there. But how do we deal with that? And Pastor Jay said, let's turn to Ephesians. And those six items are followed with the seventh, and that is prayer. And we need to remember that we fight not against flesh and blood. We're not against people. These are spiritual forces in heavenly places. And we <clears throat> uh, can use prayer. That's the seventh item of our warfare. And in the Lord's Prayer, it says at the very end, you know, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or, in another, it says, lead, uh, deliver us from the evil one. All right, so those are the two ways Satan gets us. He'll go for us with temptation through the flesh, or as what he is, the accuser. He'll bring accusations against us, saying, you had those thoughts. They weren't even our thoughts. He plants them in our mind and says, how can you be a Christian? You're not a Christian. Well, yes, I am. I put my faith, it's not by what I've done. It's all by grace, it's not my works. I trusted in him. It's by grace I'm saved. All right, so that's what we shared, and I encourage you uh, in a small group meeting, that's where you can come. If you have doubts, if you have fears, we're in a war, uh, you know, we just, the war is happening, and when the ground is shaking, the ground is shaking around us. Where is our faith? Where is our hope? It's in the Lord. He said, you know, that um, stand firm against the Lord and he will flee from you. We don't have to be protected from Satan. We need to stand firm and he'll flee from us. All right, so come on out or find your own small group and share the things that are your, on your heart and be encouraged as we were. Okay, thank you, Pastor Jay. Amen, <clears throat> amen, Brother Mike. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. Good morning. Um, reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Amen.
I do want to thank you, church, for praying, uh, uh, for praying for me, for, for praying for these services. Uh, uh, it's been quite a week. You know, I, I, I sat in my room the other day, and I realized, I really did, after all these years, I mean, I, it, the thought might have come to mind here and there, but I really, really realized why pastors don't like to preach on spiritual warfare. Um, stay away from it. You, all hell is going to break loose, and, and, and I understand that. And, and that's why a smart pastor is going to ask people to pray for him. I don't know how many of the people prayed, but uh, for those of you that prayed, I know where two or three come together in his name there is he. So thank you for your prayers. It was a crazy week, really was, um, <clears throat> especially yesterday, Saturday. Friday and Saturday gets really hard with these kind of messages, but um, I just was there in my room. I was literally being attacked, and, and so uh, you know what it's like when you, you know exactly what you want to say, you know exactly what you want to write down, and you're sitting there with the laptop ready to type it down and and. and and the words are not coming out. It was just the weirdest thing in the world. It's just the words are not coming out. And then I start. I was attacked by tiny little uh, uh, gnats. You could hardly see these little flies in my room. And I mean, I, I killed. I stopped at forty, and I just closed the Venetian, Venetian, Venetian blinds and and start, try to focus where I needed to focus. And at one time, it just seemed like there was a torrential storm. I need your prayers. When, if I ever send out an email asking for prayer and those letters are in capital letters, just know there's an attack and I need your prayers. Uh, so thank you, those of you who prayed for me uh, this week. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, so last week, right? Last week we, we, uh, we, we, we preached an in, in intro message from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. And there we discovered that, that Paul uh, was coming near the completion of his letter, right? He's coming to the end of his letter, and he begins that second part, that, that last part. He begins the, that last part of his letter uh, by giving, uh, and he's writing to the church at Ephesus, right? And he's also writing to the church of today. How many of you believe that? Is this just for Ephesus? I only saw one hand. You believe it's for us as well? Any? My, amen. All right, and, and, and so he's writing to the, to the church at Ephesus, and he's writing to us. And in, in that letter, he begins by giving two commands. You remember the first one was, uh, he says, he says be, sti- be, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In other words, we need to make sure that we're right with God. Before Paul gets into the nitty-gritty of this last part of his letter, perhaps the most important part, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Make sure you're right with God. The armor of God would do you no good whatsoever if you're not right with God. That's what he's saying. And then in verse 11, he says, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and that's our memory verse for this month, right? So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Put on the full armor of God. And he reminds us of the need to have this arm of God always upon us. In other words, if you have one part or two parts or one piece or two pieces or five pieces of the armor on, you're still incomplete. There is still an open ground and you're vulnerable. Church, we're still vulnerable. If we have five pieces of the armor, we're vulnerable. There is an unguarded part of our lives that is exposed to the devil and you better believe he's going to attack that part of your life. So having part of the armor is not enough. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. Let me just say that Paul is in prison here, and he's probably seated right there in his prison cell, and right next to him, perhaps within five or six feet, is a gigantic soldier with the complete armor that a soldier would wear, watching over Paul. And Paul looks at this armor and looks at the pieces of the armor. And though he sees it in the physical realm, he begins to pen the words of Ephesians chapter 6 in the spiritual realm. And remember that God causes his soldiers. So we are in an army. Mike was right. There is a war and we're part of that war. We're in the army of the Lord. And it says that in in, in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, we're, we're soldiers of Christ. And so it is absolutely important that we have the armor on. No soldier goes out to fight his battle 
without the armor. And if he does, he will not come back alive. And then Paul tells us why, right? He, he, he tells us why we need to put on the full arm of God. And he does it by describing the spiritual battle that is going on right now in the heavenly realms against the enemies of God and against the people of God. Against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and, and against the spiritual forces of evil. Church, these are multitudes of fallen angels they're rulers of darkness. They're demonic forces that, that are dead set out on a daily basis to attack you and me. And that's why God provided an armor so that we can withstand these attacks that come against us. And not just us, but in the lives of other people that we know. Put on, he says, the full armor of God. Today we're going to touch on three, of the, three pieces of of this armor that God has provided for us. We're going to touch on these three pieces that he's made available for you and for me. And he made them available for the very purpose of overcoming or withstanding or coming against these forces that are so real. And so we need to make sure that we are prepared. Amen? So what I want you to do is join me in prayer, please, and I want you to do me a big favor. I want you to hold someone's hand, and you're going to pray for that someone. Whoever that someone is, whether you know them or not, whether you know what's going on in their lives or not, I want you to hold someone's hand, and I want you to just start praying for that person. I want you to just start praying. I need everyone to stand, please. Hold someone's hand. If you can't stand, you can stay seated as long as you're holding someone's hand and you are praying for them. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. While I'm praying, please pray for that. For, in fact, begin by praying. Just start praying. You can pray out loud. You can pray in your spirit. The enemy can't hear if you're praying in your spirit, okay? He can't hear. If there is any rebuking to be done, he can't hear you. And so you need to pray out loud if you're going to rebuke, if you're going to pray for someone's spiritual walk with God in the name of Jesus. Just pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We invite your presence in Jesus' name. We know you are here. In Jesus' name. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. For your grace, Lord. For your faithfulness, Lord. For your presence, Lord. Jesus. Mm. Mm. Jesus. Mm. Father, we bless you this morning for your presence. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for uh, you're here today. You're here to minister. You, you made that clear throughout this week. You made that clear. That you want to do something in his heart, our heart, Father. You made that clear. Father, I pray uh, that you would, I, I pray that you would unclog, clogged ears. Ears that are close to your voice. I pray that you'd unclog them in Jesus' name. I pray that you would open closed eyes. Eyes that are closed to the supernaturalness of our God. Eyes that are closed to the workings of the Lord. Eyes that are not open to what you're doing or what you want to do. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, that you are soft in hearts that have become hard. Hard with religiosity. Hard with failures of the flesh. Hard with the conditions of our world. I pray against those hearts. I pray them to be, I pray to be softened. I pray every wall to be broken. I pray every padlock to be broken. I pray every chain to be broken. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would guide and that you would direct. I pray against that voice that perhaps is whispering in his ear or her ear right now that this is a waste of time, that this is not real, that this is not true. I pray you to silence that voice in the name of Jesus. We rebuke you because you are defeated. We rebuke you, the blood of Jesus covers this church, this building, every man, woman, and child seated in here today in the name of Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to have your way. We exhort Jesus, we uplift him, we lift him up. In his name we pray and for his glory we gather. 
Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. Amen. Amen. Okay, notice up on the screen, please, uh, verses 13 and the first part of verse 14. Verses 13 and the first part of verse 14. Paul says, Therefore, put on the full arm of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and, 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 and having have done every after having have done everything to stand stand firm then i'm going to read that again therefore put on the full arm of god so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand stand firm then let's think about this we can do everything we need to do to stand the boxer goes into the ring and he's prepared for this fight He's done everything he needed to do to stand and to fight and to win. And by the first round, he's knocked out. The Bible says after you've done everything to stand, stand from the... So the, the word stand there means to, to steadfastly, to be steadfast in your standing. To be steadfast in your standing. So he tells us four times in those three verses, Paul tells us to stand. But before he tells us to stand these four times, he tells us in verse 10 to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Why would he do that? He does it because there's no way we can stand firm. There's no way we can stand firm. There is no way we can stand firm unless we're strong in the Lord. Unless we're in the right place with Jesus. Unless we're standing with him, unless he is our strength and our shield and, and our ability to hold on. You see, church, we're, we're, we're talking here about spirit beings. We can't see them. You can't see the enemy. And so you can't defeat this spiritual being in the physical realm. But we try, don't we? I mentioned that last week. We're fighting in the physical realm. We're fighting against each other. We're not forgiving each other. We're, we're, we're having a hard time because you said this or you did that or you forgot to do this or you forgot to do And so we're fighting the wrong enemy. We cannot defeat a spiritual force in the physical realm. That's why we need Jesus. And that's why I encourage so much the importance of, of, of having an intimate relationship with him. That's why he's here, because the battle is in the spiritual realm. And so if we're fighting in the physical realm against people, we're fighting the wrong enemy. And behind it all is a happy devil, because we don't even see him. And sometimes don't even realize that it has anything to do with him. And so God provides this armor. And, and, and it's important to know this, this truth here, that, that God provides us with this armor, but he doesn't put it on for us. At least a portion of that. We'll talk about that in just a little, a little while. But, but notice he does it. He says, put on this full armor of God. It comes from God. It's provided by God. But God doesn't put it on for us. We're responsible to put on the armor. Which means that we can have the armor of God at our disposal. And it does absolutely nothing for us. Because it's just laying there. Put on the full arm of God. We're responsible to do that. God, in His grace and mercy, provided it for us. We're responsible to put it on. Put it on. Let me just say that, that every one of the pieces of the armor have a direct link to Jesus. 
I'll show that briefly in every point that I share between this week and next week. But every piece of the armor has a link to Jesus Christ. Again, that is why it is so important that we have a genuine relationship with Jesus. Because he's part of every one of these armor. He plays a part. He plays a role in that. And so Paul encourages us and he challenges us to put on the full armor of God. And then he says, when the day of evil comes, what is this day of evil? The day of evil is that day when, when, when nothing goes your way. How many of you had days like that? Right? It just, nothing went your way. Everything you planned didn't happen. It's that day when Satan says to his, to his uh, designated associates, he says, okay, this is the day. Launch your attack. This is the day. Break up that marriage. This is that day where he says, okay, bring friction into that home. Uh, break up all of their dreams. You know, get the blood test to come up with results that are disturbing. This is the day. Go into that home and disrupt the relationship with husband and wife and, and mess with the relationship of mom and dad or the children. He says, this is a, that's the day of attack. It's when everything seems to be coming against you so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground we spoke last week about how we need to be prepared not when the battle comes or after it comes but we prepare ourselves before they come he says uh, put on the full arm of god so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground And then from here on, Paul gives us, he begins to introduce these spiritual pieces of the armor of God that every man, woman, and child should be dressed with, clothed with on a constant basis and how to put them on. So, so let, me, let me just say that there, there are some slight differences there are some slight differences in the wording to the introduction of the first three pieces and the wording to the introduction of the last three pieces. So please listen carefully. <clears throat> Let me read this to you. It's from Neil Anderson's book, The Bondage Breaker. I recommend it big time. But pray a lot, for the battle will begin. He says this. He says, <clears throat> it would appear from the verb tenses in Ephesians 6, 14 and 15, that three of the pieces of the armor, belt, breastplate, and shoes, are already on you. Having girded, quote-unquote, having put on, quote-unquote, having feet fitted, quote-unquote. These pieces of armor represent the elements of your protection made possible when, G when you receive Jesus Christ and in which you are commanded to stand firm. The Greek tense of quote-unquote having signifies that the action it refers to was completed before we were commanded to stand firm. Tony Evans says this, not on the screen. He says that because of the verbs used in the Greek, the first three pieces of the armor refer to a state you are already in and should always be in, whereas the last three pieces is what you use in an as-needed basis. Food for thought. <clears throat> so some people are comfortable with saying, hey, I take it that I need to put on the full arm of God every single day. And, 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 and so they do that. You know, they practice that. And then there are some who say, uh, <clears throat> I believe that those three pieces of the armor would put on me the moment that I gave my life to Jesus, and I just need to believe it and claim it by faith, as is the case with my relationship with Christ on a daily basis. 
So whether you take the stand that says, I'm going to put on the full arm of the, these three pieces every single day uh, because I believe I need to, or if you say, um, I believe that they're already on by faith based on the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus and he died for my sins and filled me with his spirit, I already have them, and so I claim them in Jesus' name, regardless of which stand you take, it doesn't matter. Here's what matters, that you have them on every single day. That's what matters. That whether you put them on or claim they're on, that they're on every single day. It is a commandment from the Lord to put on the armor of God on a day-to-day -day basis. The complete armor. Amen? <clears throat> so let's notice the first piece of the armor up on the screen. <clears throat> The first piece of the armor is found in the first part of verse 14, where Paul says, he says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. <clears throat> so Jesus says in John 14, 6, right, John, uh, 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 Mike uh, quoted it, right? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the, I am the truth, I am the life. So in, 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 in uh, Isaiah 11 and verse 5, there is a prophetic picture, a messianic picture of Jesus wearing a belt of, of righteousness. You see Jesus wearing this belt of righteousness, pr prophetic picture of the Lord in Isaiah 11 and verse 5. Uh, um, let, me, let me read to you this here. For we're told that the belt of truth served to stabilize the body to protect the midsection and to provide the soldier with a place to restrain his garments so that his movements in the heat of the battle would not be hindered. <clears throat> Notice up on the screen, Neil Anderson says that since Satan's primary weapon is the lie, please hear this, since his primary weapon is the lie, your belt of truth which is what holds the other pieces of the armor in place, is continually being attacked. Satan knows that if he can disable or cripple you in the area of truth, you will automatically become an easy target for his other attacks. <clears throat> uh, Neil Anderson, by the way, is an author. He is a prophet. He is an expert on spiritual warfare, dynamic man of God. I take very seriously everything he has to say regarding spiritual warfare. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, in John 8, 44, Jesus warns us, right? We are warned. Church, we are warned. about. We don't need to read this from, from, <laughs> from Neil Anderson to know that we've been warned in Scripture. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Keep praying. So we've been warned in Scripture that, that uh, in John 8, 44, Jesus calls him a liar. Uh, in, in fact, he goes a step further, right? And he calls him the father of lies. He's the father of lies. He's the one that brings lies of deception. And church, it is so important that we know who we are. We need to know who we are, naming it and claiming it so that we can withstand and come against these cunning lies of the father of lies. In John 8, 32, Jesus says to his followers, he says to them, he says, you will know the truth and the will set you. Jesus says that. He says you will know the truth. That is, you will have that belt of truth buckled around your waist, and that belt of truth that is buckled around your waist is a constant reminder of the truth of who you are. It's a spiritual belt that we wear constantly that is upon us that reminds us of who we are church we need to know we need to know what God said in his word about who you are why you are and whose you are but the only way to know that is to be in this book it's the only way to know who we are. The only way to, to understand that is to be in this book. And if we're not in this book, when the enemy comes and strikes his lies, we will not, we 
Church, we will not have the armor that we need to attack him back. In other words, we will not be able to protect his attack because one of the pieces of the armor is missing from our lives. The belt of truth must be buckled around our waist and we need to know that we can't exercise truth unless we have that truth. And we can't have that truth if we're not spending time in the truth. And some of us even this week have realized the ugliness of the lies of the devil when we're not in this book. We believe all kinds of enticing sounding things that are different from what we've heard. The devil is so very, very good at that. In Genesis 3 and verse 1, Satan speaks to Eve and he says to her, Did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And in verse 3, we find that Eve did not know what God said. She thought she did. Perhaps like some of us sometimes, she thought she did. Oh, yes, she, she thought she knew, but she did not know. And the devil had a field day as he often has when we don't know what God has said. Here's a good in inventory to take for ourselves. This is good spiritual inventory. Uh, am, I listening, am I listening to other voices instead of the voice of God? Am I spending more time on social media, watching the news and listening to what's going on in our world? Am I spending more time of my day listening to all of that that I am listening to God? That is spiritual inventory in our lives. We have to be in the truth. We have to be in His Word. We need to be listening to what He is saying. Church, to, to, to have the belt of truth buckled around our waist means, and, and, and that's a commandment, it means that everything that I do, everything that I think, everything that I desire, everything that I want, everything that I plan has some kind of a connection with the Word of God. There's a connection there. There has to be a connection there. That's the belt of truth. I want truth. Who wants the lie? If we're living for a lie, then we don't need this. But if we're living for truth, we need God's Word. And, and when we have God's Word, we're, we're able to discern what's not right. And when we discern what's not right, we reject it in the name of Jesus. We reject what does not cooperate with His Word. So these forces of evil have five areas of our lives that they want to attack, and they all connect, you see, as we go on. Five areas of our lives, and one of them has to be with truth. How much time are you spending in the Word of God? Yeah, we did start a class this morning, Transformed. My gosh, that's a powerful class. Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. here at the church, Transformed. Why? Because I want to know truth. I want the belt of truth buckled around my waist. An excellent class. Hard class for me to be in because I'm home meditating and getting ready for God's Word today, but I encourage you. At 6 p.m. tonight here at the church, we're starting a class on, on how to handle our money, how to handle our finances. Do we need that? Does the, 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 does the devil attack us with our finances? Absolutely. So the classes are being offered Spirit class, Holy Spirit class, the classes are being offered. Why? Because that's what told me on Tuesday when Mike shared something, that the moment he said it, God told me he's going to share on Sunday morning. That's why I knew he needed to be up here. He's talking, and the moment he said it, God said he's going to share that Sunday morning. Thank you, Mike, for your sensitivity to that. And the devil would do anything he can to keep that from being told. And so we need to make sure that, that we're in the Word of God and, and anything that deviates from the Word of God, we need to reject it. Resist it. Get thee behind me, Satan, because it's a lie of the devil. He's the liar and the father of lies. Amen? Let's notice the second piece of the armor. Second part of verse 14. <clears throat> 
It says, with the belt of truth, buckled around your waist. That is, you know, in place. So have, the, have the, this belt, right? This belt of truth around your waist and have this breastplate of righteousness. That's what I meant. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And so in Isaiah 59 and 17, we get another one of those, uh, you know, uh, messianic, prophetic messianic prophecies of the Messiah, Jesus, wearing this breastplate of righteousness. There's a connection, and every, Jesus is in every single one of these armors. And, and that's why we need to be, make sure that we have a relationship with Jesus. He's the one that gives life to them in our own lives. Let me read this. We are told that the Roman soldier's breastplate, primarily made of bronze and backed with leather, was worn around the chest, protecting the heart and other vital organs. In poor spiritual analogy, the breastplate guards the heart, the seat of our affections and our emotions. Yet in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and it's beyond cure. Unless we invite Jesus into our hearts to change them, only he can change them. And that's why God tells us in Proverbs 23 and verse 26, give me your heart. It has to be changed. And so if we're standing firm, that means that our hearts have been made right with God. And if our hearts have been made right with God, that means that they've been changed for the better. And if they've been changed for the better, that means that they were surrendered to someone else. And if they've been surrendered to someone else, that someone else is Jesus. And if they've been surrendered to Jesus, that means that they are filled with His righteousness. And that's why our hearts have been made right with God. Because Jesus gave us His righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's his righteousness, church. It's his righteousness. It's not ours. See, see, when Paul is talking about righteousness here, he's not speaking about our righteousness. We don't have any righteousness. The Bible says in Romans 3.10 that there is no one righteous, not even one. Not even one. And, and, and so when, 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 when we invite Jesus into our hearts, what, happen is, what happens is he comes and fills us with his righteousness. In, in, in other words, the, the, in, the righteousness of Jesus, the theological term, is imputed. It is, it is credited to us. It's placed in our hearts, and we're credited with his righteousness. Church, an exchange has taken place. Jesus gave us his righteousness, and he took our sinfulness, not that he became a sinner, but he took our sinfulness and therefore went to the cross to die the death that we were supposed to die because he took our sin from us and gave us his righteousness. And that's why we need the breastplate of righteousness. It's not based on our righteousness. Church, if you think that you, heaven's going to open for you because you are righteous, you're in trouble. It's His righteousness, not ours. And that's where our security comes from. Not your righteousness, His righteousness. And we're commanded to, to put on this breastplate of righteousness and allow it to do in our lives. So we need to constantly have this breastplate of righteousness on our hearts. So, I mean, let's be for real, right? It, it, though we can, we can rejoice in having this, 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 positional, this position given of the righteousness of Jesus. We can rejoice in that. But let's not forget that we still have this tendency to fall, fall and to mess up. We still have this tendency to, 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 to fail God. He's not finished with us yet. And that's why we need to claim that righteousness all the time. Our righteousness will not qualify us. So he's not finished. But, you know, but, but 
standing firm also includes the need to understand and to apply the principles of confession and repentance. We need to understand that. That's part of standing firm with the breastplate of righteousness, knowing that when we mess up, we have to confess and repent and get right before God so that He can continue His activities in us and through us against these demonic forces that are coming out against His work in our lives. And so standing, staying tuned with Him, holding on to Him, declaring who we are, the breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness protects our hearts and reminds us that we have been declared righteous. It reminds us that we have been declared righteous. How many of you have ever heard the whisperings in your ear? You messed up again and God is angry with you. How many of you heard that? You, you messed up again. Are you really a Christian? Are you really a child of God? You don't belong to God. He's angry with you. You don't deserve it. Well, he's right about that. We don't deserve salvation, but we have it because of Jesus. And if we're wearing that breastplate of righteousness, we discern immediately those lies. And so we have the ability, God-given ability, to make choices that are toward righteousness. We can live righteous lives, but if we don't, please hear this, if we don't, if we mess up, it doesn't mean that you don't have the righteousness of Jesus. It means that you believe the lie. It means that you didn't believe. We need to know who we are. I want you, I want you to know who knows. You know who knows who you are? Satan the devil knows who you are. He knows you're washed in the blood. He knows you're a child of God. He knows you belong to Jesus. He knows heaven is your home. He knows you have eternal security. He knows you're a child of Jesus. He knows that, but he, he doesn't want you to know it. And he's so very, very good about that. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you have questioned your salvation before? You know what I mean. We need to know who we are. The breastplate of righteousness reminds us that it's not our righteousness. It's his righteousness that qualifies us as sons and daughters of Jesus. Are you equipped with the breastplate of righteousness? You see, the breastplate of righteousness is what protects us from the taunts that tell us we're someone that we're not. Are you equipped with the breastplate of righteousness. Notice the last one, the third piece of the armor, verse 15. He says, And with your feet fitted, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. <laughs> hallelujah. And someone can say hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, with your feet fitted, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Others' translations talk about the shoes, having the proper shoes. Same idea, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, uh, um, My peace I give you. I do not give to you a world like a, a peace like that of the world. The world gives peace. Can you imagine that? Jesus says the world gives us peace. It is a non-lasting peace. It is a deceptive peace often. Uh, it's a peace designed to pull us away from the things of God. He says, I've given you peace. I give you peace different than that the world. In fact, it says in Isaiah 9 and verse 6 that he is the prince of peace. You remember the story in Luke chapter 2? Uh, we celebrate Christmas morning here at the church that the angels began to sing that today, right, a Savior has been born and, and, and that peace will be given to all people who are his. So, so he says that your feet be fitted. Make sure that your feet are fitted, that is taken with this, this gospel of peace. Let me read this to you. We're told that the Roman soldiers, they wore sandals or what's called a caliga, a half boot, that had nails driven through the bottoms to provide the soldiers with the surest of footing on the battlefield. He did not have to worry about his feet slipping in the heat of the battle, for he was always well grounded. Paul's spiritual lesson is that the gospel is peace strapped underneath your feet and my feet. Thus, wherever we go, we have and bring peace. Not one amen to that? Hallelujah. 
Yeah, that's God's, God's faithful to His Word. So the Bible says that we're to, we're, we're, we're to walk in the Spirit. We're to, be, we're to walk in newness of life. It says that we're to, we're to keep in step with the Spirit. It says that we're to walk as Jesus did. Church, when, when we are fitted, when, when our feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, uh, we're, we're walking alongside Jesus. We're walking in His ways, we're living in His ways, we're following His lead, following His design, and we have His peace, and we want to share that peace with people. We want to tell people about that peace. Oh boy, do we need that today. How many people today have no peace? The news tells us there is no peace in this world. The Bible tells me there is peace in this world, and His name is Jesus. It's who we're walking with. Our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace that we're walking with Him. We're talking with Him. Uh, Paul, says, Paul says, it's something you have to share, right? You have to share His peace. Paul says in Colossians 4 and verse 2, he says, Pray for me that a door would be opened, that I would share the message of hope, that I would share the, mis- the mystery of Jesus. Pray for me. Paul wanted to share the good news. Our feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Gospel is the Greek, the Greek word there is, is, is good news. Euangelion, good news. I want to share the good news. When we're walking with our feet fitted, it, fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, we're looking to share his peace with people. Some of you may remember who went with me to the nursing home, uh, a lady named Helen, and she had a husband named Paul. You remember, Caleb. And some of you do remember, I'm sure. And Helen and Paul, we had so much fun with them, right? I remember they were both on their wheelchairs. He passed away right before COVID. Um, and I remember I would go there and Caleb would go with me and I would drive, I would pull, push him on his wheelchair and, and Caleb would push her or vice versa. And we would go all around the entire nursing home, you know, oh, and he'd be, ah, and she'd be, ah. Well, he went away during COVID and um, I would visit her. And I remember visiting her one day and she was, this is before COVID, she was sitting there one day and I walked in and the nurses came up to me and the staff, the workers, the helpers, they came up to me and said, you need to do something about Helen. And I said, what's wrong with Helen? She's having one of her fits. And um, everyone in the dining room had literally left the place because she was angry. She was furious. And they said, we can't handle her. I need you to try to. So um, I said, okay. I went in the room. Nobody was there. There are people outside the door watching. Is she going to smack him upside his head or throw something at him? And I said, I sat there and I, and I, I paraphrased. I said, Helen, how you doing? Ah, nobody said happy birthday to me. She had moments like this. You know, they didn't give me an extra cookie today or cracker or whatever it was. You know, I didn't get my juice today. And, you know, so she would have fits of rage. But that day it was because no one said happy birthday. And I said, Helen, happy birthday. And I hugged her. And, and, and I said, Helen, what about Jesus? There's something about that name. Listen, you can go into, into a school or your workplace or the, the different places like that and mention any name, any spiritual figure. But when you mention Jesus, problems might happen. I remember school in New York City that I was told from a teacher who worked there that um, uh, someone went into school with a Bible and they got suspended. And yet people went into school with knives and they were reprimanded. That name Jesus is a name the devil hates. And um, so I sat there with Helen. I began to tell her about Jesus. And I said, Helen, not only does he say happy birthday, he gave you your birthday. He gave you your reason for living. And he loves you, though we as humans might fail you. He loves you in more ways than you can imagine. Peace just fell on that entire room. Completely, her, con, her complete composure, her attitude, her countenance, everything phew, gone just like that. There's something about Jesus there's something about that name. And Paul says, Pray that a door would be opened that I would share Jesus. People need peace. People, and, and, and so when, when we're fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, we want to take that peace to people. We want to tell them about it so that they can experience it themselves, so that, that they can have that, that same peace 
a peace that our world seems to be getting further and further and further away from. Do you feel what I'm feeling? You feel that? We, we, in fact, I, I, I think that, that we have reversed. I think we have reversed peace. This is peace to the world. This is peace, okay? He told me something I didn't like yesterday. I couldn't sleep at all. So I got up this morning, went to work, and I told him what I had to tell him. Now I got peace. That's peace. We've reversed it. Peace is, he hurt me, now I'm going to hurt her, uh, him. And, and, and until I hurt him, I won't have peace. I got to go and get him. I'm going to slash his tires. Now I have peace. We've reversed it. That's peace to the world. The world doesn't know where to find peace because everywhere it's tried to find peace has failed. But they've bypassed Jesus. They've bypassed his word. They'll mention the word, but they'll bypass the word and they won't trust his peace. See, we need internal peace in order to exercise external peace. If there's, if there's a war and a battle going on in here, I'm going to have very little peace to exercise out here. Peace begins on the inside. And when we invite the Prince of Peace to come on the inside and to take charge and to take control, now I have peace to offer because it's been given to me. The Prince of Peace, Jesus, living within our hearts and in our lives. And so we need that kind of peace. We need His peace to come and move in our hearts. Is the world coming to an end? Uh, I mean, uh, are we going to be attacked by terrorists? Is Russia, China, and North Korea, are they going to come together, become one world nation, and destroy the world? Is the spectacular uh, reputation of the United States of America, America, is it coming to a close? Is it coming to the end? The anxiety, the fear, the worry, the nervousness. Ah! Scary. But when we have the peace of Jesus, when we have the peace of Jesus, it's not that we don't care. It's not that I don't care what's going on in our world. It's not that I'm oblivious to what's happening on in our world. It's not that, it's that in spite of what's going on in our world, I have peace. I know who's in charge. I know who's in control. I know he's on the throne. And I have that peace governing. We have that peace. If we have that peace of the armor on, we have that peace. Wherever we walk, we can be walking through a storm. We can be walking through chaos. We can be walking through all the things the devil is throwing at us. But as long as we're walking with our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, we have peace. It doesn't mean there's no storm. It means that in the storm there's peace. It doesn't mean there's nothing to worry about. It means that I don't like the word worry because there's a commandment not to worry. It doesn't mean that we have nothing to be concerned about. It means that in the middle of our concern, there is peace. It, 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 it doesn't mean that everything is fine and dandy and I'm going around you know, skipping and having a wonderful time. It doesn't mean that. There are going to be storms. There are going to be challenges. There are going to be tornadoes. There are going to be all kinds of challenges. In fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the more the enemy is going to attack. But we have this peace that keeps us going. He's faithful to his word. Put on the full arm of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And I think that a lot of what's going on in our world is because it, we're living in these God-forsaken days. We've forsaken God and have made choices that have nothing to do with God. And so everybody is running crazy like a chicken without a head trying to find peace. But they can't find it the way they thought they could find it. And so they're exercising it in a different way. Peace is found only in Jesus. I give you peace, not like the world gives. I give you a different kind of peace. It's his peace that we need, church. How happy are the feet of those who bring good news. It was the same author, Paul, who wrote that in Romans uh, 10, 15. And, and he's, you know, he's quoting from, uh, I think it's Isaiah 52 and verse 7. He's quoting from Isaiah's writings. How happy are the feet of those who bring good news. 
They're bringing good news because they have good news in their hearts. And, 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 and they need to bring this good news. They want to share this good news. Not all of us are called to be evangelists. Not all of us are called to be pastors. I understand that. But all of us are called to tell what the Lord has done. What's He done? But pastor, I don't, I don't know theology. What's He done? I don't know the Greek and the Hebrew, but, but what's He done in your life? Can you say that? Has He given you joy? Has He given you victory? Do you have a place in heaven? Do you know where you're going to go when you die? It's all we need to know. That's all we need. <laughs> Our feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. My friends, God loves you. He did everything He can. He did everything He can to equip us, to prepare us for these battles. There's no Christian in all the world that should be going through these battles without the arm of God. And if we are, um, it's not because God has failed us, it's because we've not kept up our end of the bargain. Put on the full arm of God so that when the day of evil comes, so that when it comes, you may be able to stand your ground. So you've put on that full armor of God already. So Jesus, the Prince of Peace, when we're fitted with the readiness of, of the gospel of peace, Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace, walks alongside us. And it's as if he says, hey, I see the storm, but don't forget I'm next to you. He promises to see us through. He takes us through those storms. He takes us through those battles. He helps us to get through. Notice up on the screen, we'll close with this. Equipped for battle, we must be clothed with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. God has called you and me as members of his army. We've been recruited. How many of you knew that? I've been recruited. That day, I won't sit there with someone and says, God, say, God wants to recruit you into the army. They might have had bad experiences in the army. Uh, right, Amy? But anyway, um, you know, so we just don't know, right? But, but God has recruited us. There is a spiritual battle. This is not a playground. This is a battle zone. This is a battle zone. And, 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 and God has equipped, provided the equipment for you and, and, and myself to be properly equipped to counterattack or to come against or to withstand these forces of evil mentioned in Romans, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that we can withstand, we can, so that when the day of evil come, you may be able to stand your ground. We can. Amen? Amen. So let me pray. Let me just pray. And um, today we spoke about the three first three pieces of the armor. Next week we'll talk about the, the next three pieces. Now, I don't know who in here in this place uh, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for, uh, thank you for what you've done for us. God, you did not forget us. You're not a, uh, you're not a God who has abandoned us. You're not a God who left us on our own. You're not a God who has um, left us with uh, do what you think you need to do. No, you've provided us everything, Lord. On top of the the pieces of the armor, there's the Holy Spirit. Uh, Holy Spirit. You're our shield, you're our ability, you're our ability to, to make happen what needs to happen in our lives as Christians and followers of Jesus. So Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence and thank you for your life and thank you for uh, uh, allowing us to understand these things. And I pray in Jesus' name that, that you would plant them deep within our hearts. Even as we sit and close in song, Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts even as we sit and close in songs, speak to us with the words. Even as we sit and close in songs, Holy Spirit, remind us of these scriptures. Remind us of these truths. Truth sets free. Even as we sing and close in song, nudge where we need to be nudged. 
speak where we need to be spoken to. Remove what needs to be removed so that we can hear and adequately determine the proper voice. So Lord, we commit to you the service about to end in Jesus' name. Please stand as we sing our closing song.
saw this twist there but um, uh, I, I was going to do this before the song but uh, uh, I, I, I just want to call a few of you up to prayer I just need some people to pray here for a moment I think there's some of us here that need prayer some of us need prayer we just need prayer we just need someone to pray please sit down for a moment we just need prayer and, and, and I just want to say if, if you need prayer if you, if you need to talk with God if you need to talk with God I believe the, the, the altar the, the altar right now is, is sanctified. If you just need to talk with God and meet with God, I want to invite you. Come up front and get, get on your knees and just talk with God. Maybe there's something He said to you about someone else that you need to minister to or maybe it's something about yourself. Just come on up and just take the altar and, and take some time to talk with God. And if you're here today and, 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 and God spoke to you about something, right? Something about truth. It's something about that belt of truth, something about the truth of who you are, the truth of who you are that has been attacked. Uh, and, and, and you need you, you need someone to pray for you. Just stand where you're at. And you, if you want someone to pray for you for something God said about the breastplate of, of righteousness, that, 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 that there's been an attack there, that there's been an attack about God's righteousness in your life and you've been questioning that, and you know you need prayer just stand just forget the devil and stand anyone if, if, if there's something about walking in peace where there is chaos where there is friction where there is anger where there is anxiety and anxiousness and uncertainty how it's how can we walk in peace and maybe it's something to do with walking in peace if people are standing and you're not, and if you see someone standing, please, especially if you're a leader of the church, they're standing because they're asking for prayer. Please, someone come alongside them. In the name of Jesus, just come alongside them and pray for them. They're standing because they know they need prayer about something God said to them. And if it's something about peace, you know you're just not walking in peace or, or it's hard to have peace in our world. Uh, you're not experiencing the peace of Jesus. You're just not experiencing His peace and you know it, it, it's not there. It, it goes and comes and goes and comes. Uh, just stand. Let's, let's get you to be prayed for. Let's get you to be prayed for. Please stand. If God's calling you to stand, just stand. If you want to take it a step further, come up front and we'll pray together. But if you know you need peace, you know you need the breastplate to cover you and remind you that you're a child of God, you belong to Jesus. Or you've been lied to by the devil and the belt of truth is not activated in your life, just stand. Just stand. Let someone know to, to pray for you. Anybody else? Anybody else? You need prayer. Anybody else? Thank you. Praise God. Anybody else? If you're standing and you need someone to come along alongside you, would you raise your hand, please? If you're seated and you, you, you can't stand, for whatever reason you can't stand, I rebuke you, devil. If, if you're seated and you can't stand, you can't find it in you to stand, just raise your hand. We'll get someone to pray for you. Anybody? Just raise your hand. Anybody? Anybody? Maybe it's someone at home right now. Maybe it's someone hearing this message right now. You weren't waiting for this. You weren't expecting this. Guess what? Neither did I. 
Maybe you're home and you're struggling with with that belt of truth, and you've been believing a lie. Maybe you're home and and the breastplate of righteousness is not activated as it's supposed to. And 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 you're receiving the lie. You're believing that you're not of God or that there is no hope for you, no hope whatsoever because of your past. Maybe it's you at home that there, there's no peace in your life. You thought Jesus was the answer, and you're not experiencing His peace. You need prayer, my friend. You need prayer. Contact your pastor. Contact a pastor, a, a spiritual leader, and 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 have them pray for you and and break from this hold in your life that that is not supposed to be a part of your life. These spirits have been defeated in the name of Jesus. So if you're home, call someone. Call us at church. Five seven zero seven eight four six one six one. Call us. Talk to us. We'll we'll pray for you. If you're a child of God, you're a child of God. That means you have Him on your side, as well as on your inside. Father, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you this morning, Holy Spirit of God, for your faithfulness. We thank you that you do not give up. You're a God of insistent grace. You insist. On changing your people, you insist, in spite of us, to change us, to work in us. You insist on bringing peace into our lives. You insist in reminding us that we are saved in Christ Jesus. You insist on reminding us of your word and your truth. You insist on quickening us to be in your word and to pray and to claim and to name the scriptures in our lives of what the promises we have in you. And so, Jesus, in Your holy name and in the power of Your name, by Your finished work, I declare victory over Your people. I declare victory over Your church, not just this church, but Your church as a whole. I pray for churches. I pray for ministers that are going under attack. I pray in Jesus' name for victory to come. We rebuke the father of lies who causes us to think that we're victims when we're victors in Jesus. We declare your authority over our lives. We declare your authority over our church. We declare your authority over our ministries. We declare your authority over the children ministry. We declare authority over our youth, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We declare authority over our leaders in Jesus' name, elders and deacons and deaconess alike. We declare the authority of Jesus over our finances. We declare the authority of Jesus over our prayer life. Our church involvement, our Bible studies, I declare, and we declare together the authority of Jesus over the Community Alliance Church and our impact in our communities, in our workplaces, in our homes. In Jesus' name, we declare the victory of the cross over every satanic trap and hold in our lives. In Jesus' name, we declare victory. In Jesus' name, we praise you. And we thank you, and all the people together say, "Amen, Amen." If anyone needs to hang around before before you leave and talk with someone and pray, please don't leave. Don't leave. If you need to to vent, you need to talk, you need to pray. Don't leave. Uh, other than that, you're dismissed.